you've got what it takes. You are fabulous, you know. You already knew that, just needed someone to remind you. You've got what it takes. That's the good news. There's a downside to that. I've got what it takes, but it takes everything I've got. It's all very well and good to have this grace that we've been singing about right through the service. It's great to have all the wonderful gifts that God gives to us, but they're not just to hit us as a dead end. They're to be lived out. And that's part of what we've been singing, what Steve's been saying. So our text for today, really, it's verses 7 to 13, but it flows on from this verse. To each one of us, grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So if you want to follow along on your outline, there's things for you to fill in. What's the key word, you think, in this verse? Very good. Look, you're, you're right on top of this. It's about grace. And our first heading is grace equips me because everything else that flows on in the rest of this passage flows on because of God's grace to us, his goodness, his generosity, his kindness. It all flows out of what he has done in his grace. Now, if you take a step back from grace, where did this grace come from? Everything flows out of God's holiness. And the, the song in heaven, the song that the angels sing is holy, holy, holy. Holiness is the purity of every aspect of God's character and everything flows out of his holiness. All the things that we enjoy of God's character flow because he is holy. And today we're thinking specifically about grace. But all the things we have, grace gives us the provision for everything that we need. But his mercy and his love and his justice and his goodness, his kindness, his compassion, everything flows out of holiness. Now, we need to respond to that in some way. And so we lift up to God who we are. And of course, the key ones that you see again and again in Scripture are faith, hope and love. Now, faith because of what he's already done for us. We're putting our trust in what he's done, the goodness of his grace, all the provision that he's made. We have hope for what he will do and what he's promised to do and committed to do into the future. And our love for him is something that's not just some wussy emotional feeling, it's a very practical outworking. That's what love is and that happens every single day. Now, here's a question for you, Bible scholars. Now your turn to do some work. Who gets grace? Now come back to our verse. Any suggestions out of the first line? Each one of us. Everyone gets grace. It's here for all of us. It's not hard. It's not a trick question. God so loved the whole world that he gave and he keeps on giving. This provision comes out of his grace. So who gets it? Each one of us. You get grace, you get grace, you get grace, I get grace. Everybody has enough grace from God to live out the life that he's called us to live. And just a couple of references that throw that into perspective. Who does God want to be saved, according to Scripture? Any suggestions? Everybody. God wants everybody to be saved doesn't mean everybody chooses to get saved but he wants everybody to be saved he wants you to be saved he wants the people you love to be saved God wants everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth fully how does that happen how do you get to know this so fully well it comes in exactly the same way who does God want to be saved God does not want anyone to perish but everyone to come to know the truth fully. How does it happen? It's as we turn away from ourselves, as we give up being self-absorbed and self-centred, that we repent, we turn and face God. We, We find our fullness in Him. That's how we repent. And it's also how we come to know fully all that God has got for us. Back to our text. When do we get grace? Again, come on, you Bible scholars. You only need to go as far as the first line. When do you get grace? It's not a trick question again. It has been given. 
Why were you so scared? <laughs> it's there. It's there. You can't get it wrong. It's been given to us already. Every single one, each one, has already got grace. It's all around us. It's in us. It's through us. It, it supports us. We all get grace. It m might be good to think of grace like the air that we breathe. It's all around us. You're never out of God's grace. He loves everybody, saint and sinner. And he wants to lavish his grace into our lives as we breathe in his grace, as we live his grace. Back in our text again. Come on, you're still working here. I'm not doing all everything. <laughs> uh, you're up for it. How do we get it? It's a gift. God just lavishes it on us. He loves us. He cares for us. He wants the best for us. So the grace that we need to get through whatever any day holds is his grace. He just keeps on giving and giving and giving. You want more? It's here. It's as abundant as the air and more so. It's always available to us. That's how we get it. Don't have to earn it. Don't have to work for it. It's just given. So it's God's wonderful gift in Christ. Now, if you're following on your notes, our second major heading. This grace that we get equips me for heaven. Now, verses 8, 9, 10 uh, are all about the one who ascended is the one who descended, first of all. And we looked at this last week. So this one slide is all we're going to get on those verses. Just to fill out the picture, he descended. He came from heaven at the first Christmas down to earth. He went from earth down to the realm of the dead when he was crucified. He rose again out of the realm of the dead back to earth at the resurrection three days later <clears throat> and about excuse me, six or seven weeks later he ascended back to heaven. And that's why we read in our text. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens. The position that he holds, that's what we've been singing, it's what we've been praising because of where he is now. The glory and the position that he holds is in heaven. Want to know more? Go back to the net and look up last week's message. <laughs> this is what we're on about today. We've got this grace and it equips me for life about here and just about anywhere else that we might go. It's always available. It's what we need to live now. Here we go, back to our text. The heading is the people that God gives to us. And we see that in verse 11. He gave some people to have various gifts. These are the people who are available to us as a church. I don't think every church gets every gift, but we, the church, God's people, are gifted. And around you there are people who are God's gift to you. I like to say in, in private, so don't let this out of the room, that I'm God's gift to women. <laughs> well, I didn't expect that sort of response. <laughs> I'm God's gift to men. I'm God's gift to the church. Also to children and small furry animals. But <clears throat> we are gifted. We are gifted and we are the gift as God gives us to the people around us, the people that you're sitting with, they're God's gift to you. They're God's gift to you so that you can be nurtured by them and so that you in turn can give something back. We're here for each other. It's one of the reasons why church is so important. So we get something that's in verse 7 to each of us, individually and then we come down into verse 11 we get something that is given to all of us collectively remember what it is how's your short-term memory to each of us we have the grace that we need to all of us collectively we have apostles prophets evangelists pastor teachers the gifted people and we shouldn't be concerned Protestants get a bit 
all oh, scared of it, this. Don't have, you don't have to worry about one holy Catholic and apostolic church. It's, it's just the church, the whole church, all the congregations of the world over all time make up one church. And we're just one of the many local congregations of the literally millions that are going to be meeting this day around the world. Why do we have people in the church? I sometimes wonder, you know, if um, the church might be better off if there were fewer people, (laughs) fewer problems. But God's a problem solver and so he wants more and more people. He wants how many people to be saved? Everyone. So where did we get to? Next heading is the preparation that we are gearing up for. And so the people around us are equipping us, equipping us, the saints, equipping ordinary people like us, ordinary people in ordinary churches. This is what we're here for. We are here being prepared. That's why you turn up Sunday after Sunday. So you become a little more prepared than you were last week for whatever it is that lies ahead of you in this coming week. So how do you get equipped by this grace that God is giving to you? Baby steps, one thing after another, just little steps. And things like humility, things like teachability, things like taking a big breath of courage, to take the step of obedience, to just try something. This is what we look like in God's eyes. We are toddlers at best, stumbling along and he's there ready to catch us. This is what the family of God looks like from God's perspective. And next we see the practice that we move into for the equipping of the saints for the work of of service. Now, suddenly the picture changes from toddlers. You don't send toddlers out to work. But I noticed some grandparents brought along some young people today and put them to work in the kitchen. No name should be mentioned to protect the guilty. We're glad you did. And we're glad you did too. It's work. Don't sit back and think, This is great, all these people around me, God's gift, they're going to do everything. We're all here for the work of service. We're here to put into practice what it is that we're supposed to be doing. Now, how does that work? Some churches make the mistake, and hey, look, we've all been here and done this. Let's run a program. Let's flog ourselves silly putting together this program where we're all going to work ridiculously long hours and do crazy things in the hope that the world will come to us. God never told us to do that. What do you think he suggested we might do instead? What do you think he would... Which direction would he turn the arrow? You people are theologically right on top of this today. (laughs) For God so loved the world that he came to the world. He went out there into the broken, dirty, smelly, awful, sin-ridden world. And then when Jesus was about to go back to heaven, where did he send us? Out into that same broken, dirty, smelly, sinful, awful world. This is where we're to go. This is where we're to live out what it is to be a follower of Jesus. And Jesus modelled that right through his ministry until he went to heaven. He said the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Where are we doing Our best work, it's not here in this building. It happens out there. I had an example of that only this week. Eleanor and I were hosting someone in a a secular coffee shop (laughs) in the world. And we chatted openly about Christian things. And as it happened, there was someone listening. There was uh, a woman who was sitting 
just behind me. And looking for all the world, full-blown Hindu, the whole Indian garb, and whatever, whatever it's called, the sari sort of stuff. And as she got up to leave, she came over, reached out, put her hand on the shoulder and said, it's wonderful to hear fellow believers talking openly about Jesus and scurried off before we could even say anything in response. <laughs> That's where it happens. It's happening out there in the world and people are listening and people are watching and that's how it's supposed to happen so that we can be salt and light out there. That's where it, we're to take it. Go into all the world in order to make disciples. That's what we're on about. And so that's why we're not, we're not a church anymore that runs lots of programs and flogs ourselves silly saying, come to us, come to us, come to us. We're going to listen to what Jesus had to say and follow his model. It happens out there. Now, back in our text. The process is the next thing that we note. And what's the process that we are going through? We are being built up. We're in the process of being built up. It's okay for you to say, I'm a work in progress. I'm not there yet. I am being built up. The building, the building is a continuous thing. I haven't been built, finalised. I am in the process of one who's being building up. <clears throat> um, no, I don't quite look like that yet. <laughs> in the mirror, I think I look like <clears throat> But the reality is, but when God sees us, he sees us in the process of being champions. We are building up the body of Christ. And how do we do that? Be strong in the Lord. It's not be strong physically. Now, there's probably nothing wrong with looking after your body, provided you don't need to eliminate cheesecake from your diet. I'm sure it's <laughs> fine. But it, we are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. It's all about Him. We're to be strong in Him and find our strength in Him and find our grace in Him and find our solutions in Him, not in the circumstances we want Him to change. It's go straight to Him. He is the one who gives us the strength that we need because all strength is in Him. Well, this one, and this really ties in with our text today and links us back. Be strong in the grace. How do you be strong in the Lord? You'll be strong in his grace. How do you be strong in grace? You'll be strong in Christ Jesus. We keep coming back to our Saviour again and again. He is the one who provides for us all that we need. We can rely upon him. And then their position. I'm sorry, this is a bit out of kilter on your, um, on your sheet. The position is next. And there are three things that we look at for our position as God sees us until we attain to the position of unity and of knowledge and of becoming mature. This is the position that we have already in Christ and that we are moving to being built up into in the process. It's the, this position. And it's first of all, until we come to the unity of the faith. This unity you have to have with someone else. You can't be unified with yourself. You need other people. Again, we're back to needing church. And so unity of faith is about my relationship with other people, these people. And we come also to the knowledge of the Son of God. Here's our relationship with God on top of the relationship with other people. And knowledge is not just, oh yeah, I know about Jesus. Isn't he the one who someone once said or read about? The knowledge is personal knowledge. I know this person. He is my friend. We're together. And then the final one is we are to become mature. And this is my relationship with myself. God wants you to have a healthy relationship 
with yourself, to know yourself and see yourself as he sees you. Could there be anything more important? To have the right relationship with yourself because that allows you then to build that up. We're being built up from knowing who you are in Christ that will improve your relationship with him and that in turn will go up and build your relationship with other people. How do you do that? How do you have great relationships with other people? Now, you can give them gifts of cheesecake. That, <laughs> th that would help, but it's not the main deal. There is something more important than what you just give as a at a physical level. In my relationship with others, there's something that you could do. Here's one suggestion. I think it's a key suggestion. Thank them for what they've done. Thank them for what they've said. Thank them for even just turning up to be the encouragement. And then you might also go beyond that and do something for them for which they may also say thank you. Now, just you know, the first one's easy. Thank them. You can do that, can't you? Yes. Good. Yeah. <laughs> it's slow in some cases. You can, can't you? Yes. But we all can. We can all find something for which we can thank one another. And it builds up your relationship. You want to have good relationships with people? Give it a whirl. You know, how's life at home? Try saying thank you. Uh, <coughs> this, the second bit is much harder. Do something for which they may be thankful. If you do it saying, I did this and they didn't even say thank you. If that's the case, you didn't do it for them. You did it for yourself. You did it so that I could get a thank you, so that I could be seen as important. They may or may not thank you, depending on where they are in their journey. Now, if you're mature enough to be able to be thankful, then rejoice in that and, and use that as a tool for maturity. But if they're not up to that stage where they can be our other person-centred and say thank you to you, don't get ticked off at them. Pray for them and keep on serving them and doing the things for which one day they may arrive at a point where they can say thank you. Now, that's your, how to you improve your relationship with others. How do you improve your relationship with God? Look for the theme here. Thank him. Thank him with praise. Thank him for what he's done as you live in obedience to what he calls you to do. Thank him for the promises that he's given you. Thank him for the care that he provides you. Thank him for the people that he's given to surround you. It will, as you come to God, and instead of saying, God, here's my shopping list for today. I want you to do this, this and this, which is how most prayers are prayed. Try something radical this week and turn up and say, God, thank you. And then give a list of things you can be grateful for. It will improve your relationship with him no end. He won't change, but you will. <laughs> my relationship with myself. How do you build that same theme of thanksgiving into your relationship with yourself? Well, try doing something today for which your future self will thank you. When you get yeah, a year down the track and you say, I'm so glad that I did <laughs> X. I didn't hear that and it's probably just as well. <laughs> Thanksgiving helps every relationship. Try it. Now, back in our text. And this is where we come to the end of our text. This is the purpose. This is what all of this has been building up for. This is why grace was given in the first place. This is why churches exist. This is why God is at work. This is why we're called forward into this better place for this purpose. And what's the purpose? That we can experience, that we can be, that we can be the overflow of all the fullness of Christ. So that all that he is fills us up and leaks through all the cracks 
in these crackpots so that he just is living out his life in and through us. So how do we do it? Now don't dig him in the ribs. You know he's a crackpot. <laughs> he knows too. He doesn't need another reminder, another nudge of the ribs which will open up the cracks even further. How do I do it? Without the nudge. Live to produce Christ's likeness in my person of who I am and in the practice of how I live out that life. Now, <clears throat> internally, your thoughts, your emotions, your memories, your hopes and dreams, your fears and anxieties, the choices and the decisions that you make, they are all opportunities. They're all building blocks that you can pick up and turn into thanksgiving to build you up into Christ-likeness. Now, it doesn't mean all your thoughts are pure and holy, but it does mean you can turn them into a way to say, thank you God that I don't need to maintain this thought in my head. I can change this, my mind to think your thoughts. Let this mind be in you. It's also in Christ Jesus. Who who thought what does the father want and lives out that your emotions told you often enough you can't control your emotions uh, they're all over the shop you've got no they're, they're slippery characters and you'll never grab them but you can respond to them and respond to them Thanks, thank you Lord that I've got these emotions sometimes they mess with my head the memories you, you've had experiences some of them good some of them bad, some of them ugly. But you can turn, thank you, Lord, that you brought me through that. You brought me through the valley of the shadow of death. You brought me out of this dark place. You carry me through even though I'm still there and not yet out there. And all this, anyway, look, all the stuff that wells up within you is opportunities for thanksgiving. What about all the stuff from outside, the world, the flesh and the devil, people? that surrounds you the, the work that you need to do the leisure time you have just the circumstances of life and there's a million of them and they're all different again they are all opportunities for us to say thank you Lord for what you have done thank you for what you've protected me from thank you for where you are taking me thanksgiving is a wonderful response to the grace of God that's brought you to today that's brought you to this point you are here at an appointment that God set so that you can be transformed to more Christ-likeness. What this means is that there are no obstacles to you becoming more mature in Christ. Just let that sink in for a sec. There are no obstacles that God puts in your way to stop you from becoming more and more mature and Christ-like and more attractive. Not a single obstacle. He will not do that. There are only opportunities for you to step up and become more Christ-like in how you think, how you act, how you respond, who you become and what you do. There are no obstacles. And once you see that, the path opens up before you in wonderful ways because God suddenly clears the decks and you're ready to go. So whatever you do, you can do it for the glory of God. Whatever the circumstances, whatever's happened to me, it's all for the glory of God. He's got something good in mind for you. He's taking you on through this journey to a great place. But what if the journey looks like this? And for some of you, it does. What if you say, oh, you don't know the boulder I'm trying to push uphill. You don't know the circumstances I've got. You don't know how little talent I have. You don't know how weak I am. You don't know how bad my journey is. Well, again, there's some actual good news for you, even if this is you. Even with no talent, even with no qualifications, there are many things that you can be and that you can do. You don't need 
a degree to be committed to something bigger than yourself. You don't need some special talent to be courteous and to give thanks to someone. You don't need some special skill in order to be diligent in whatever it is that you do or energetic or enthusiastic or ethical or passionate or pray or to prepare yourself for what might be ahead or to just be punctual or respectful or teachable. Anybody can do it. And here's the call. No matter who you are, no matter where you've come from, no matter what you're going through, and no matter what lies ahead of you, even if this is your story at the moment, by God's grace, you can do it. You can indeed. You've got what it takes. You've got it. What is it? It's the grace of God. You've got it. You've got all that you'll need and if you need more, it's always there. It's always available. But it takes everything you've got to do the journey, to push the boulder, to go through and to achieve at the end. God's enabling you by his grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the commitment that you make to us that you've given us all that we will ever need. You have provided for us everything that it's going to take to make a difference in our lives. You have given us everything and then more than we'll ever need. Lord, help us to take our eyes off our circumstances, to stop looking at the wind and the waves and the storm and to walk on water to you because you give us the grace to do so and now may that grace bless you as you go out into your week to overcome and be more than conqueror by the grace that is yours Amen